So there are parts of this country that many people call flyover. Eh, Got to turn it on. That many people call flyover country because I just don't think anything exciting is happening in that area of the country. They think you got to go to one of the other coasts to really find something exotic like New York or L.A. Without stepping on too many toes, I would suggest that Kansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota are probably the top three flyover states here in the United States with Oklahoma, Missouri, and Iowa probably coming in a close second. But you know, I'm okay with that. I've been to New York and to L.A. and to San Francisco and Washington, D.C., and I'm not thrilled with any of those cities. Most of them are pretty malodorous when you get out there and walk around their streets and that. For me, having grown up in Waldenburg, Arkansas, population 64, salute, I still consider myself a redneck at heart. You know, I love to hunt, I love to fish, I love to play in the dirt like I did today in planting my garden. You know, there's just something that just is refreshing when you smell a freshly mown field of hay. It just smells so sweet. Oh, and by the way, do you know it's only six months and three days till muzzleloading season starts? But who's counting, right? City boys have pickup lines. Country boys have pickup trucks. Truth be told, there are still, there are parts of the Bible that are flyover as well. There are some parts of Scripture that I would say a lot of people haven't even read, and I would wager that many of you haven't read either. Perhaps one of them is like the book of Leviticus with all its Levitical or priestly jargon. Or maybe yours is Numbers with all its, well, numbers that are there. One that's top on my list is First Chronicles. Why? Because it starts out with nine chapters of genealogies. That's why. And then, of course, there are the Old Testament laments. Oh, talk about Debbie Downer doozies here. If you were in a good mood when you started reading them, you won't be afterward. These laments are are hard to, or not something that you turn to when you're looking for a spiritual lift. Laments are not for the faint of heart. But laments begin early in the Old Testament. I mean, you have Rebecca in Genesis 25 saying to us there, if it is this way, why should I live? And then Moses in Exodus 5 says to us, Oh Lord, why have you mistreated this people? And then you have Gideon in Judges 6 complaining, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? 65 of the 150 psalms are psalms of lament. And then there is the entire book in the Old Testament called Lamentations. Heart-wrenching questions are pondered and asked in these laments. Why is this happening? Where are you, God? Is there any justice in this world? Is there any order left in this world of ours? God, have you abandoned us? Have you forgotten us, O Lord? Laments regard the abyss as bottomless and never-ending. Hopelessness defines everything. And what is our common response to all these laments? Fly over. Ignore them. We'd rather lose words like, live by words such as, keep your chin up, play with pain, put your grown-up pants on, think positively, big boys don't cry. Well, don't tell that to Job. Job 
who again was described in Scripture as upright and blameless, a man who feared God and shunned evil. After the numb shock of having his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, sitting there in silence with him for seven days and seven nights, as with a massive shriek, Job finally speaks in chapter 3. Hopefully, you read that chapter and answered the questions that were in the bulletin last week in preparation for today's message. Because when you look there, you found words like darkness, night, shadow, blackness, grave, death, and cloud. In, his, in this chapter alone, five times... Five times Job asks, why? Why did I not perish at birth? Why were there knees to receive me? Why was I not hidden in the ground like a stillborn child? Why is light given to those in misery? Why is life given to a man? And then he ends this lament with these words, what I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. After chapters 1 and 2, Job's livelihood is in ruins. His family is dead, and his health is broken and crushed. He has become an object of horror and a sickening sight. In chapters 1 and 2, Job was the model of godliness and patience. But now, Job lets it all hang out. He looked at all of his hardship and hell, and he refused to ignore it. He refused to fly over it. He lamented to the Lord. And in reality, this chapter has a lot to teach us about how to deal with suffering and loss. One of the things it teaches us is that we cope with sorrow by going through it. I wish I could tell you that we could get past sorrow by going around it or tunneling underneath it or taking a big jump over it, but that's not true. We cope with our sorrow by going through it. Notice that I didn't say that we get past it. <laughs> If the sorrow is deep enough, if the hurt is deep enough, in this life, we'll never get past it. But we can get through it. It's tough, though. Real tough. Quite often, instead of working through it, we stuff it in. We deny it. We try to, uh, to uh, survive life's losses by, without lamenting, um, because grief is unpleasant, it's messy, it's ugly, it's something that we avoid, we ignore it. There are things that have happened in our childhood, things that have happened in our, at school, things that have happened in our relationships or in our marriage, things that have happened to our health, and we haven't grieved over the pain and so we're stuck some of us are stuck at age 14 or age 26 or age 34 or age 55 because we haven't grieved a major loss in life and then we wonder why we suffer from anxiety phobias fears and low self-esteem. 
the wisdom of God our Creator in the book of Job teaches us why. It's because we haven't learned how to lament. Unresolved, unmourned grief causes a boatload of problems. So many are stuck in all kinds of bad behavior because they haven't grieved that alcoholic father or that unloving mother or that mistreatment by a teacher or the experience of prejudice and bigotry. And so we're stuck. Rather than actually feeling it, rather than actually going through it and going through that season of mourning, it's easy just to put our heads down and ignore it. Damn the torpedoes, full steam ahead. Doctors tell us that a lot of our body aches and pains are from unresolved grief, from unresolved regret or unresolved resentment. That pain in the back, that pain in the rear, that ache in the neck. A lot of that is caused by motions that we stuff down inside of us that God never intended us to bottle in. God's wisdom is to let it go. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5, verse 4 of our gospel lesson today? He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Who gets comforted? those who have the courage to mourn. Cover-ups don't get comforted. If I cover it up, if I ignore the pain, if I deny the pain, if I pretend it doesn't exist, if I'm too afraid of my emotions, then I don't get comforted. David says in Psalm 23, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Note the phrase, walk through. We walk through it. We don't go around it. We don't tunnel underneath it. We don't try to jump over it. We walk through it. How? The same way Job does in our text. The same way a lot of characters in the Bible get through grief and loss. There's a pattern, if you haven't noticed, of how people deal with grief and loss in the Scripture. Here's the pattern, if you haven't noticed. The first thing that they do, the first thing we do, is complain. It's okay not to be okay. Job was so low in our, God, in our Old Testament lesson here, in our text for tonight, that he said it would be better not to be even live anymore. It's like he was saying, why should I go on living if living is going to be this painful? After I complain, then I appeal. I appeal to God's character, to God's nature, who he is. I appeal to God's mercy, to God's kindness. 1 John 3, I appeal to God's love. And then we remind. I remind God of his promises. I remind God of his truth. I remind God of, who, of what he has said. I remind God of his reputation. And then I express. I express my trust in God in those things that are beyond my control, that I do not understand. No matter who it is in Scripture, no matter what they're going through, they follow this pattern. I could point you to many psalms or a dozen prayers throughout Scripture, complaining, appealing, reminding, expressing. That's how we care for ourselves. That's how God cares for us, by revealing to us this pattern, this wisdom. Another thing we learn from Job is that we survive sorrow by looking past it, by looking to Jesus. See, I'm not suggesting that we wallow in weeping here. We go through it, but we look past it. We look past our sorrow to see Jesus, who knows what it's like to lament, 
Oh God, Jesus knows what it's like to lament. Jesus complained and appealed and reminded and expressed his trust in God while suffering hell on the cross. Jesus used Psalm 22 and quoted it as his lament. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night and am not silent. I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. They have pierced my hands and my feet. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. In the midst of unbelievable suffering, Jesus laments to God because he knows that God is the only one that can do anything about his situation. And even in his deepest hell, when, Jesus had, when God had totally abandoned him, Jesus never gave up and expressed his trust in God even at the very end. Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. Look past your sorrows and look to Jesus. He knows your pain. He knows your loss, your suffering, and he knows how to give you strength. One of my favorite psalm verses is Psalm 30, verse 5. It says, Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. As your pastor who loves you and cares about you, I encourage you to weep during the long night of this life but also affirm that joy comes in the morning. Joy comes because of Easter morning. On that first Easter morning, our Lord's own lament is turned into a song of everlasting deliverance. On that first Easter, our Lord turned the pain of sin into the joy of freedom and forgiveness. You don't have to carry your pain with you. The Lord is willing to take it from you. Those of you who have been given the gift of faith, those of you who trust in the Lord, know this. You too will one day sing that song of everlasting deliverance. One day, we will stand before our God singing, I know that my Redeemer lives. And on that day, we will have no death. We will have no pain, no sorrow. There'll be no more lamenting. Because, as God says, the old order of things has passed away. But until that day, in the valley of this life, we learn and apply God's wisdom from Job. Job teaches us to fly blind because we don't know what's happening in the spiritual realm. Job teaches us sweet surrender. God is in control. And tonight, Job teaches us to learn to lament. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. And so may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand and make confession.